It was a story that made international news. Remnants of a controversial scientific experiment dating back to the 1950s had been uncovered in a Melbourne laboratory. Australia's Radiation Safety Authority has confirmed that the bodies of thousands of Australian children and adults were used in scientific nuclear tests without consent. The experiments lasted more than 20 years and involved reducing the bones of dead children to ash. In the largest survey of its type carried out anywhere, the bones of the dead had been analysed for one of the most poisonous substances on Earth, strontium-90. A byproduct of nuclear weapons testing, which can find its way into human bone through the milk of cows. The discovery of the bone samples raises more questions than it answers. Did radioactivity contaminate the milk supply? If so, who knew it was happening? And what effect did it have on the population? Some of the answers lie in the story of maverick Australian scientist, Hedley Marston. In the mid-1950s, Marston risked his career when he discovered that the most powerful forces in the British Commonwealth were lying to the Australian public. For Hedley Marston, the trouble began in late 1955. It was the height of the Cold War. Unknown to Marston, Australia's Federal Security Agency, ASIO, had begun investigating his background. Why, it asked, had a communist newspaper published flattering articles about him. Was he a communist sympathizer? Those interviewed ridiculed the suggestion. Hedley Marston was a British patriot and the most celebrated biochemist in the country. I met Hedley as a child. He had this enormous charm, um, but as a child I always thought it was a bit sus. And the more I've learnt since, the more I've learnt that the charm was only a weapon to achieve his ends. For more than 20 years, Marston had run the Division of Animal Nutrition for Australia's foremost scientific organisation, the CSIRO. Throughout his career, he was fated by industrialists, artists and the cream of society. His fame came as a result of a major scientific breakthrough. On a large tract of coastal land in South Australia, sheep and cattle were wasting away and dying on what appeared to be good pasture. The discovery of a lack of cobalt and copper in the soil saved hundreds of farmers from ruin and helped turn similar regions around the world into fertile grazing land. Marston's staff had made the discovery that he bathed in the glory. He was honoured as a Fellow of the Royal Society of London and championed as a hero by Australian farmers. He ruled with an iron hand. He ruled by fear. Um, he certainly saw nothing wrong in the least with appropriating all his junior officers' results because he was the head of the division and they were just junior officers. And um, he regarded himself as being like the conductor of an orchestra. In October 1955, ASIO gave Hedley Marsden a security clearance. For an upcoming series of atomic weapons tests in Australia, the British wanted his help to set up top secret radiation experiments with animals. His work on the project would spark the bitterest dispute in Australian science. From October 1955, 
Hedley Marston became an essential component of the British atomic tests. Little did they know the kind of man, the ego of this man. A letter to Fred White, Chief Executive Officer of CSIRO, personal and confidential. Dear Fred, it isn't necessary to thank me for my readiness to cooperate with the British in their atomic project. I'm uncooperative only with humbug. My own negative feelings about CSIRO becoming involved in military secrets has always been clear. Had the experiment been other than one concerned with the protection of civil populations, I would not so willingly agree to lend a hand. I understand the sensitivities involved. Yours, Hedley Marston. Britain had already exploded three atomic devices in Australia. But no effort had been made to measure the impact of radioactive fallout on the continent. With a new round of tests due in 1956, the British asked Marston to supply animals and scientists to study the biological effects of fallout within a few hundred kilometers of the test site. With CSIRO's expertise with ruminants, the decision was made to use sheep and goats. Well, the animals were to be fed pasture, which was laid out in the anticipated uh, line of fallout. And the pasture was collected and fed to the sheep. And then uh, the animals were autopsied and each organ was assessed for the presence of the various fallout products. The aim of the experiments was based on the fact that three or so major atomic bombs would obliterate Britain. There are those that were killed, but there would be all those survivors. What were you going to feed them? And the first question there was whether the fallout would be so dangerous that uh, the requirement would be to kill, shoot all the grazing animals because the uh, fission products that came out of the bomb would find their way into animals and they would find their way even into food. Marston received sensitive measuring equipment from the British but he soon realized their experiments were poorly conceived and would certainly fail. If he was running them, as he privately desired, they would be far different. Hedley Marston decided this was the perfect opportunity to show his British counterparts how meaningful research should be carried out. He would design his own experiments, which were both clever and audacious. He would study the radioactivity that fell to Earth, not merely over a few hundred kilometers from the test site, but over the entire continent. He comes to see that there's a chance for him to gain even greater power and prestige by doing an experiment Australia-wide. For his experiments, Marsden would use sheep and cattle to sheep and cattle to investigate the uptake of iodine-131, one of the dozens of radioactive isotopes created during an atomic explosion. Well, it was clear that one of the biologically important radionuclides was radioiodine. 
And the advantage of radio iodine is that it has a very clear exposure path and it's quite easy to measure. If it gets onto grass or pasture and it's uh, eaten by the sheep, some of it will pass straight through, but a lot of it will go to the thyroid gland and concentrate there. And of course the thyroid gland is, is in the throat and it's quite easy to excise the thyroid gland, take it out of the sheep and send it back to the laboratory for careful monitoring. Headling didn't tell the owners of the sheep and cattle the use to which they were going to be put. And that was going to be important for the British and Australian governments, that we kept this as quiet as possible. Information about radioactive fallout was considered classified by the nuclear powers. The first the public heard of the dangers came in 1954 when an American hydrogen bomb test in the South Pacific yielded three times more destructive power than expected. A vast radioactive cloud blew over the Marshall Islands. The inhabitants suffered severe burns and nausea. Fallout also engulfed a Japanese fishing trawler, the Lucky Dragon. The Japanese fishermen were exposed to relatively high doses of radiation and the radio operator died. Now, it was impossible to keep the lid on this story. And gradually, gradually, the, the realization that these atmospheric explosions contained hidden dangers. To alleviate growing public concern over fallout, Prime Minister Robert Menzies created an Atomic Weapons Test Safety Committee, manned by some of the nation's leading physicists and a meteorologist. Chief Defence Scientist Leslie Martin was named chairman, but the dominant force on the committee was brilliant British-born physicist Ernest Titterton. During the war, at the age of 29, he triggered the world's first atomic explosion in the Nevada desert. In the early 1950s, Hedley Marston's close friend, Mark Oliphant, invited Titterton to establish a school of physics at the new Australian National University in Canberra. Sir Ernest was very much a nuclear bombardier. He really did believe that nuclear weapons had a role to play in, in preventing a, another catastrophe like the Second World War. He also had quite a clear view in his own mind that radiation was not dangerous. So putting somebody like that in charge of the safety of the Australian public and, and controlling fallout was very much like a poacher becoming a gamekeeper. The safety committee's role was to ensure weather conditions were suitable for firing at all future tests. It would also independently monitor radioactive fallout at 34 locations across the country. The safety committee let Headley know that they were also measuring I-131 around the country as well as he was, and they had a different kind of system. They had this sticky paper and that collected, settled dust. It trapped fallout and they were able to measure. After months of preparation, Marston was ready for the most secret and politically sensitive project in the history of CSIRO. But then Britain changed its plans. With Cold War tensions increasing, it would now urgently explode two atomic devices on the Montebello Islands off West Australia, the site of its first test four years earlier.
two explosions at the Montebello Islands uh, during 56 were used by Headley to check his procedure, to check the equipment, and to check that he was ready for the Maralinga show, as he liked to call it. I carefully had people send in a, a sample thyroid test just to make sure everything was going. And the thyroid arrived in suitable condition and so on. And lo and bloody behold, Monty Bello had come on. Letter to Dr. Fred White, Chief Executive Officer of CSIRO. Secret. We have found conclusive proof that a band of airborne radioactivity has passed over northern Australia in the last 10 to 12 days. Uh, we should be able to trace its course from the findings of the routine examinations of thyroids that are being made here. Insofar as I can judge, there's no reason to become excited about the implied hazard. Yours, Hedley. Weeks later, news came through that another atomic trial was imminent on the Montebello Islands. But Marston had suffered a heart attack. It could not have come at a worse time. An official press release claimed it was a small atomic device that at almost eight times the destructive power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, this was Britain's largest atomic test so far. Instead of sending the radioactive fallout out to sea, it went right across the whole of the northern half of Australia. A few days later, a technician on the other side of the continent was calibrating a Geiger counter for the Australian Air Force. On this particular day, um, I had one unit which would not respond to its normal calibration. Uh, its background was substantially higher than a normal background count. and. I walked around with a thing in my hand, thinking, what can it be, where have I gone wrong? And as I approached the window, the count started to increase. And I thought, it's strange, so I stepped back and it reduced, and then I got suspicious, so I started running the Geiger counter around the actual window frame. And I may add, it was raining cats and dogs in Brisbane at that particular time. I stuck it outside, and the count went off its rocker. And obviously, we're having radioactive rain. Within one hour, a car turned up with a couple of officers, and they removed the Geiger counters we had there that we had repaired, as well as the radioactive material. And the owner of the business uh, informed me there that I had to, uh, not to mention to anyone or even talk about it, because that he was now under the Official Secrets Act. And uh, I never discussed with anybody since. That day, radioactive rain fell throughout Queensland. As much as the government tried, it could not contain the story. For the government, it was an absolute disaster because we have this prospector near Cloncurry, bawling his billy as the story goes, and he's bawling his billy as the story goes, and his Geiger counter goes berserk. This prospector raises the alarm. It's not subject to the Official Secrets Act, and it hits the national press. Now, the Minister of Supply, Howard Beale, has written in his autobiography, it could have lost him his job. 
So it was a massive problem for the government. Meanwhile, fresh animal thyroids were arriving at Marston's laboratory from across the nation. The thyroids were put into the radiation counter. The results were noted. And they were hot. I, I alone had the results, which were hot. The claims of atomic rain were true. Iodine levels in animal thyroids were up to 4,000 times higher than expected. The fallout area was enormous, ranging from Alice Springs in central Australia to Rockhampton on the northeast coast of the continent. I rang Professor Martin, who was a member of the Australian Safety Committee. He doesn't want to know. It was awful. The data was sent to London, to the scientific mastermind of the tests, Sir William Penny. The telegram stated bluntly, there may be political danger. But according to the British, the radioactive iodine levels were well within safe levels and there was no danger to the Australian population. Headley had a heart attack and was in hospital during the time that these results were coming. His assistant came to me and pleaded with me not to tell him, which I didn't do. He came out of hospital and was absolutely furious that he hadn't been told. On his return to the laboratory, Marston secretly recorded a conversation with the safety committee chairman, Leslie Martin. He accused the committee and the British and Australian governments of lying to the population. Les, this is getting just beyond the damn joke. Have things got away from you? We took in good faith there was no fallout on the continent. Well, it was official report coming from the minister. You must have the paper clippings from about that time and there's no possible harm to befall anybody. It is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen and that will make every scientist indignant and I should imagine stir up the socialists. We just lack confidence in anybody now. Hadley didn't like physicists. But physicists were beginning to pronounce on biological matters. That is the impact of radiation on, and the hazard of radiation in the human population. How dare they, thought Hadley. Marston's doctor ordered him to cut back on his workload. But he was determined to continue his experiments to see if the safety committee was looking after British or Australian interests. He expanded his thyroid collection points around Adelaide, the closest city to the tests. And unknown to the safety committee, he would also monitor radioactivity in the air over the city. Fortunately, an American scientist, Professor Perry Stout, had set up a rather splendid piece of equipment the year before to measure natural radioactivity in the air over Adelaide. Perry invented this uh, filtering device which would suck 20 or 30 litres of air through uh, a filter pad which would sift out anything radioactive, they then simply measured that with a Geiger counter. And he did that up on the, uh, the roof of the nutrition laboratory in Adelaide. And he plans to use that just in case the city was contaminated. South Australia, September the 27th, 1956, 5 p.m. South Australian time. Letter to Mark Oliphant, private and confidential. 
Oh, my dear Mark, I'm more worried than I can convey about the expensive quasi-scientific pantomime that's being enacted at Maralinga under the cloak of secrecy. And even more so about the evasive lying that is being indulged in by public authorities about the hazard of fallout. I nearly blow a gasket every time I think of it. Apparently, Whitehall and Canberra consider that the people of Northern Australia are expendable. By comparison to all its predecessors, the third Maralinga test was small. Politically, it was the most explosive. Minutes after detonation, the wind changed direction. Part of the radioactive cloud was blown in the direction of Adelaide. There was a lady here hanging the washing up, looking up in the air to the line and facing the west. And she said she noticed a very unusual reddish brown cloud, huge, stretching for miles and very high. And she thought, that's odd. It didn't look like clouds. Being a farmer and always interested in the weather, this was a strange day. At four o'clock in the afternoon, a grey streaky cloud come over from the northwest and all of a sudden it went completely dark. It wasn't normal and I didn't find out until next day that an atomic bomb had been let off at Marilinga. Headley Marston got quite angry when, when he read the official pronouncement that um, skilled men working through the night um, had found no evidence of any radioactive material. Uh, my cynical view is that it must have been too dark for them to read their Geiger counters. In the days following the test, Marston took thyroids from sheep at two research stations close to Adelaide. He measured radioactive iodine levels up to 5,000 times higher than normal. The results from Peristalt's air sampling were equally disturbing. Instead of having counts of around 20 per 100 seconds on a normal day as a result of natural background radiation, he received the day after the bomb test counts of 96,000. The people of Adelaide were never told. The people of the little towns along the way between Maralinga and Adelaide, they were never told. And if they'd read their local paper, they would have read the opposite, that all was well with the tests. Two weeks later, Marston wrote to Mark Oliphant, the director of physical sciences at Titterton's University in Canberra. He detailed an extraordinary admission by Safety Committee Chairman Leslie Martin about how the test had been let off in haste. Dear Mark, Les Martin became quite cock a hoop when I asked him if he had any record of fallout over Adelaide. He said, I can talk with complete authority, there's been no fallout over Adelaide, none whatsoever. When I showed him our observations, he collapsed and stated, no reports regarding the third bomb have been submitted to me. I left this baby to Titterton. It was a very small one. Later, he broke completely and said, the pressure was on. Please remember, the pressure was on. I'll leave no stone unturned to ensure that the essence of the report is published. His reaction was to make it public and extremely incensed that uh, the physicists involved were just as determined not to have it made public. Made public. When Marston threatened to publish his fallout findings, the Australian Intelligence Service, ASIO, marked his file, scientist of counter-espionage interest.
And Marston was convinced he was being spied on, that his phone was being tapped and that his mail was being interfered with. My dear Dave, the secret police had been tampering with my private mail. Perhaps they imagined they could frighten me into silence. I endured this indignity for long enough to obtain complete proof and then asked the people responsible to cease their nonsense or I'd call for a public inquiry. Arrogance and this sort of thing is rapidly changing Anglophiles into Anglophobes. Marston realises that uh, he's in a very dangerous situation. Not only are the British wanting to curtail his, the experiments, the uh, security net is closing in. It had become the most politically charged dispute in Australian science. In his report, Marston accused the Safety Committee of lying to the Australian people about fallout. His findings of iodine-131 in sheep and cattle were proof that large areas of the Australian continent had been contaminated. This, he said, would result in increased cases of thyroid cancer in humans. But Marston went further. The presence of iodine-131 in animals, he said, meant that an even more dangerous radioactive isotope had contaminated the food chain, strontium-90. We have low levels of strontium-90 falling out of the atmosphere at that time and landing on the herbage, being eaten by the cow, accumulating like calcium does in the milk of cows, and then in this concentrated form, it's called biological magnification, going down the gullets, children. When humans drink that milk, babies and children in particular, who are laying down bone very quickly, their bones are the places where the strontium and the calcium eventually wind up and once it's there, it doesn't go away again. It stays there with its 29 years half-life. So in 29 years, half the activity is still there. In 58 years, a quarter of the activity is still there. If Marston was correct, strontium-90 uptake would be dramatically increased by government policy, which guaranteed a half pint of milk daily to every school child. There is a very serious likelihood that internal radiation from strontium-90 may, after a latent period of some years, result in many painful deaths from cancer of the bone. Your unequivocal assurance that Marston was now on a collision course with the most powerful forces in the British Commonwealth. If he published his report, as he threatened, it could jeopardise future atomic testing in Australia. The British demanded Marston return their test equipment, and Ernest Titterton, the new head of the safety committee, insisted he delete his attacks on the committee's competence and his claims about strontium-90 contamination. Marston had never measured strontium-90, but in his report, he left no doubt where his detractors would find it. He states right at the end of his report, the proof will be found in the bones of children. All one has to do is to examine the strontium-90 load in the bones of deceased people and particularly children in the coming decades to show that I am right. During the late 50s I was employed by the Department of Supply in Perth and as part of my duties I was asked to attend a large public hospital and received from the pathology department of that hospital a package which I was to on forward to the Eastern States. 
On receiving this package, I identified bones as being those of young children. I thought to myself, bloody hell, what's going on here? Soon after Marston delivered his report, the safety committee contacted pathologists in every capital city. They were asked to provide bones from bodies undergoing autopsy. I was able to talk to the people in the pathology department as to what this was all about. And I was told that the bones were taken to the eastern states, they were ashed and analysed for the presence of strontium-90. Throughout 1958, more than 400 bone samples were analysed. In all cases, the next of kin were never told. The secretary of the safety committee wrote to all of the participating pathologists very early in the program uh, a letter saying, it may have occurred to you that the general public would not take kindly um, to the question of removal of bones for purposes of radioactive uh, testing and I therefore ask you to um, uh, treat this matter as, as confidential. The bones of people of all ages were analysed, but the safety committee requested as many from babies and stillborns as possible. We know that in some cases whole femurs of a baby of babies were taken out. They've said little tiny bones, maybe only that big. Um, um, in other cases it was skull samples, vertebrae, because they could easily be taken out from autopsy. In Titterton's first report to the government, Marston's suspicions had been realised. Strontium-90 was indeed widespread in the Australian population. Infants showed levels up to five times higher than adults. But the levels, Titterton claimed, were well below the safety threshold and would not cause damage to cells or result in cancer. The issue was that there was no real knowledge of whether there was a threshold value um, below which it was safe to get radioactivity. The safety committee assumed there was. Headley said there's no evidence for that and you have no right to reassure the public that they are not in any danger. It was a question now dividing scientists around the globe. Was there a safe level of radioactive fallout? According to the best estimates of geneticists, all of whom agree, 15,000 children are sacrificed for every large bomb tested. It is possible there is damage. It is even possible, to my mind, that there is no damage. And there is the possibility, furthermore, that very small amounts of radioactivity are helpful. But the most dramatic assessment came at an international conference attended by Mark Oliphant. Twenty of the world's leading scientists warned Strontium-90 could irreversibly damage the human race. The elephant came back very reassuringly to Marston saying that the kind of uh, opinions that were now merging internationally on this question of fallout were entirely vindicating his own opinion. Finally, in August 1958, after 18 months of stalling by the safety committee, Marston succeeded in publishing an edited version of his report in a respected CSIRO journal. But far from the political explosion Headley Marston had predicted, the story was only reported in a small circulation farmer's newspaper. Farmer's newspaper. The major city papers ignored it completely. Why didn't the Sydney Morning Herald why didn't Melbourne Sage, why didn't Adelaide's advertiser, when this article talked about the contamination of one of the cities of Australia and across the whole of Australia? Headley was pretty sure that the government used its uh, influence to ensure that the media did not uh, pick this up. 
The politicians didn't want the Australian public alarmed, having got themselves into this mess. Despite the weight of Marston's evidence, the public remained largely unaware that atomic testing had contaminated much of their country. But then in 1959, something unexpected occurred. During the second year of the Strontium-90 survey, radiation in the bones of children increased by 50%. Even though Britain and the other nuclear powers had agreed to a freeze on atomic testing. Such a dramatic increase meant that some of the contamination was coming from elsewhere. The only possible source was from past American and Russian hydrogen bomb explosions which had sent strontium-90 into the stratosphere and was now slowly falling to Earth. Increased use of bigger and bigger devices by the Americans and the Russians meant that fallout was now becoming a global problem. So that everybody on Earth was getting a dose of radiation and the consequences of this, if it had gone unchecked, would have been quite significant. Regardless of dramatic increases in reported cases of leukemia in many countries, the nuclear powers resumed atmospheric testing in the early 1960s. In 1962, the world rocked to about one nuclear explosion a week. And the levels of fallout were just going up dramatically. It really was getting to the stage where, where would it all end? A few years ago, scientists of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, working in cooperation with the Public Health Service and the Atomic Energy Commission, developed a laboratory method for removing radioactive strontium-90 from milk. As Headley Marston had discovered, strontium-90 was indeed the Achilles heel of nuclear weapons advocates. The loss of even one human life, or the malformation of even one baby, who may be born long after all of us have gone, should be of concern to us all. Our children and grandchildren are not merely statistics towards which we can be indifferent, nor does this affect the nuclear powers alone. These tests befoul the air of all men. Finally, in response to growing public concerns about fallout and evidence from around the world of rising strontium-90 levels in human bone, the atomic powers agreed to stop atmospheric testing. All future explosions would now be carried out underground. By now, as far as Headley was concerned, it was too late and too little. I think he probably would have felt vindicated, but uh, I think the wound was so deep at the time that, that uh, it was a persistent scar, as far as Headley was concerned. The minister had stated that no fallout went over a major city in Australia, and Headley knew but it did. Headley Marston monitored six of Britain's 12 atomic tests in Australia. Two of the tests, he found, resulted in radioactive contamination of cities and grazing lands, raising the question of the long-term health consequences for people living in the fallout areas. I've been told by uh, a number of people that they remembered a cloud coming down the valley of Nantawarra uh, that related to the Maralinga tests. And there's speculation, local speculation I suppose, that it may have something to do with the, 
what seems to be a high number of cancer deaths in our district. I would love to know, you know, if there is some truth in that that story. Um, I mean, it's too late to, to save my, my late husband, I guess, but it would be nice to have some answers. Unfortunately, the epidemiology is very difficult and it would certainly be clouded in the case of radioactive contamination by chemical contamination because of the vast amounts of chemicals which were used as well, many of them extremely carcinogenic. Where there's a very definite increase in the incidence of of anything but cancer in particular, um, if there is an event such as that which could be uh, assigned a causative role, then one has to be very, very careful not to deny the possibility that that could be so, and in fact I think that possibility is often denied. The true impact of atomic testing on the Australian population may never be known. But the evidence that contamination did occur lies within the remnants of the Strontium-90 bone survey. The full extent of the program was astonishing. Over two decades, bones had been taken from more than 21,000 bodies, making it more than twice the size of a United Nations global survey. It was a, a very, very big business over, over 20 years, and just to think of all of those, all of those samples of uh, ashed bone uh, lying there in storage and being used was, was, was something of a shock. The enormity of the bone survey raises questions about the motives of the safety committee. In particular, its driving force, Ernest Titterton. Did he have a real concern for the welfare of the population? Or could there have been either a personal or political motive? This huge survey, perhaps a thousand bones a year. I can't believe that there wasn't fear here in Titterton's heart, uh, that he was extremely concerned uh, to protect himself. One way perhaps of doing this was to go over the top in terms of uh, proving his innocence, if you like, or proving Hedley of wrong. It was possible through the cooperation of the hospitals and pathologists to actually sample human bones of individuals who had died. Was there any radioactivity in any of the human bones? Yes, there's radioactivity in you and in me as we sit here. You've got loads of radium in your bones, you've got loads of potassium in your soft tissues, and you've got, as everybody else on Earth has, small amounts of materials from nuclear weapons testing carried out by the Russians, the Americans, the British, the French, and the Chinese. But the levels are so small that they have absolutely zero effect on you. Titterton was right in the sense when he said it would not be a major radiation hazard for the Australian population. Where he was wrong is in saying that there was no hazard. It was not the sort of thing you would expect people of their standing uh, to actually state. And uh, so those sorts of assurances were being given for political, not scientific reasons. It was not a term that was used at the time, but, but Marston was a whistleblower. He found out that lies were being told to the Australian public, and he wanted to bring this to the attention of the Australian public. And for a long time, uh, he was kept away from doing that. If Headley had not had the anger he had and the conviction, 